A Strange Incident by S. McCurgy When I was at college there happened what was a most inexplicable incident. The matter attracted some attention at that time, but has now been forgotten, as it was really not so very extraordinary. The police, in fact, when called in, explained the matter, or at least thought they had done so, to everybody's satisfaction. I was, however, not satisfied with the explanation given by the police. This is what actually happened. The college was a very big one with a large boarding house attached to it. The boarding house was a building separate from the college situated at a distance of about 100 yards from the college building. It was in the form of a quadrangle with a lawn in the center. The area of this lawn must have been 2,500 square yards. Of course it was surrounded on all sides by buildings, that is, by a row of single rooms on each side. In the boarding house there was a common room for the amusement of the students. There were all sorts of indoor games, including a miniature billiard table in this common room. I was a regular visitor there. I did not care for any other indoor game than chess. Of course chess meant keeping out of bed till late at night. On this particular occasion, I think it was in November, a certain gentleman, who was an ex-student of the college, was paying us a visit. He was staying with us in the boarding house. He had himself passed four years in that boarding house, and naturally had a love for it. In his time he was very popular with the other boarders and with the superintendent, Dr. M. N., an English gentleman who was also an inmate of the boarding house. With the permission of the learned doctor, the superintendent, we decided to make a night of it, and so we all assembled in the common room after dinner. I can picture to myself the cheerful faces of all the students present on that occasion in the well-lighted hall. So far as I know, only one of that group is now dead. He was the most jovial and the best beloved of all. May he rest in peace." Now to return from this mournful digression. I could see old Mathra sitting next to me with a hookah with a very long stem, directing the moves of the chessmen. There was old Burju at the miniature billiard table poking at everybody with his cue who laughed when he missed an easy shot. Then came in the superintendent, Dr. M. N., and in a hurry to conceal his hookah, Indians never smoke in the presence of their elders and superiors. Old Mathra nearly upset the table on which the chessmen were, and the mirth went on with redoubled vigor as the doctor was one of the loudest and merriest of the whole lot on such occasions. Thus we went on till nearly one in the morning when the doctor ordered everybody to go to bed. Of course we were glad to retire, but we were destined to soon be disturbed. Earlier the same evening we had been playing a friendly hockey match, and one of the players, let's call him Ram Golam, had been slightly hurt. As a matter of fact, he always got hurt whenever he played. During the evening the hurt had been forgotten, but as soon as he was in bed it was found that he could not sleep. The matter was reported to the superintendent, who, finding that there was really nothing the matter with him, suggested that the affected part should be washed with hot water, and finally wrapped in heated castor leaves and bandaged over with flannel. This is the best medicine for gouty pain, not for hurt caused by a hockey stick. There was a castor tree in the compound, and a servant was dispatched to bring the leaves. In the meantime a few of us went to the kitchen made a fire, and boiled some water. While thus engaged we heard a noise and a cry for help. We rushed out and ran along the veranda, corridor, to the place whence the cry came. It was coming from the room of Prayag, one of the boarders. We pushed the door but found it was bolted from inside. We shouted to him to open but he would not. The door had four glass panes on top, and we discovered that the upper bolt only had been used. As a matter of fact, the lower bolts had all been removed, because on closing the door from the outside, once it had been found that a bolt on the bottom had dropped into its socket and the door had to be broken before it could be opened. Prayag's room was in darkness. 
there was a curtain inside and so we could see nothing from outside we could hear prayag groaning the superintendent came up to break the glass pane nearest to the bolt was the work of a minute the door was opened and we all rushed in it was a room fourteen feet by twelve feet many of us could not therefore come in when we went in we took a light with us it was one of the hurricane lanterns the one we had taken to the kitchen the lamp suddenly went out at the same time a brick bat came rattling down from the roof and fell near my feet thus i could feel it with my feet and tell what it was and prayag groaned again dr m n came in and we helped prayag out of his bed and took him out on the veranda when we saw another brick bat come from the roof of the veranda and fell in front of prayag a few inches from his feet we took him to the central lawn and stood in the middle of it this time a whole solid brick came from the sky it fell a few inches from my feet and remained standing on its edge if it had toppled over it would have fallen on my toes by this time all the boarders had come up prayag stood in the middle of the group shivering and sweating a few more brickbats came but not one of us was hurt then the trouble ceased we removed prayag to the superintendent's room and put him in the doctor's bed there were a reading lamp on a stool near the head of the bed and a holy bible on it the learned doctor must have been reading it when he was disturbed another bed was brought in and the doctor passed the night in it in the morning came the police they found a goodly heap of brick bats and bones in prayag's room and on the lawn there was an investigation but nothing came out of it the police however explained the matter as follows there were some people living in the two-storied houses in the neighborhood the brick bats and the bones must have come from there as a matter of fact the police discovered that the boarding-house students and the people who lived in these houses were not on good terms those people had organized a music party and the students had objected to it the matter had been reported to the magistrate and had ended in a decision in favor of the students hence the strained relations this was the most natural explanation and the only explanation but this explanation did not satisfy me for several reasons the first reason was that the college compound contained another well-kept lawn that stood between the hostel buildings and those two-storied houses there were no brickbats on this lawn if brickbats had been thrown from those houses some at least would have fallen upon the lawn then as regarded the brickbats that were in the room they had all dropped from the ceiling but in the morning we found the tiles of the roof intact thirdly in the middle of the central lawn there was at least one whole brick the nearest building from which the brick might have been thrown was at a distance of one hundred yards and to throw a whole brick nine inches by four and a half by three inches such a distance would require a machine of some kind or other and none was found in the house the last thing that created doubts in my mind was that not one brick bat had hit anybody there were so many of us there that there was such an abundance of brick bats still not one of us was hit and it is well known that brick bats hurled by ghostly hands do not hit anybody in fact the whole brick that came and stood on edge within three inches of my toe would have hurt me if it had only toppled over it is known to most of the readers that Sudiism was the practice of burning the widows on the funeral pyre of their dead husbands. This practice was prevalent in Bengal down to the year 1828, when a law forbidding the aiding and abetting of Sudiism was passed. Before the act, of course, many women were, in a way, forced to become Sudis. The public opinion against a widow surviving was so great that she preferred to die rather than live after her husband's death. The law has, however, changed the custom and the public opinion, too. Still, every now and then there are found cases of determined Sudhism among all classes in India who profess Hinduism. Frequent instances are found in Bengal, 
and whenever a case comes to the notice of the public the newspapers report it in a manner which shows that respect for sooty is not yet dead sometimes a verdict of suicide during temporary insanity is returned but of course whoever reads the report understands how matters stand i know of a recent case in which a gentleman who was in government service died leaving a young widow when the husband's dead body was being removed the wife looked so jolly that nobody suspected that anything was wrong with her but when all the male members of the family had gone away with the buyer the young widow quietly procured a tin of kerosene oil and a few bedsheets she soaked the bedsheets well in the oil and then wrapped them securely round her person and further secured them by means of a rope she then shut all the doors of her room and set the clothes on fire by the time the doors were forced open there were only ladies in the house at that time she was dead of course this was a case of suicide pure and simple and there was the usual verdict of suicide during temporary insanity but i personally doubt the temporary insanity very much this case however is too painful the one that i am now going to relate is more interesting and more mysterious and probably more instructive babu bhagwan prasad now the late babu bhagwan prasad was a clerk in the office in the united provinces he was a grown-up man of forty-five when the incident happened he had an attack of cold which subsequently developed into pneumonia and after a lingering illness of eight days he died at about eight o'clock one morning he had of course a wife and a number of children babu bhagwan prasad was a well-paid officer and maintained a large family consisting of brothers their wives and their children at the time of his death in fact when the doctor went away in the morning giving his opinion that it was a question of minutes his wife seemed the least affected of all while all the members of the family were collected round the bed of their dying relative the lady withdrew to her room saying that she was going to dress for the journey of course nobody took any notice of her at that time she retired to her room and dressed herself in the most elaborate style and marked her forehead with a large quantity of cinder for the last time cinder is red oxide of mercury or lead used by orthodox hindu women in some parts of india whose husbands are alive widows do not use it after dressing she came back to the room where her dying husband was and approached the bed those who were there made way for her in surprise she sat down on the bed and finally lay down by her dying husband's side this demonstration of sentimentalism could not be tolerated in a family where the purda is strictly observed and one or two elderly ladies tried to remonstrate but on touching her they found that she was dead the husband was dead too they had both died simultaneously when the doctor arrived he found the lady dead but he could not ascertain the cause of her death everybody thought she had taken poison but nothing could be discovered by post-mortem examination there was not a trace of any kind of poison in the body the funeral of the husband and the wife took place that afternoon and they were cremated on the same pyre the stomach and some portions of the intestines of the deceased lady were sent to the chemical examiner and his report which arrived a week later did not disclose anything the matter remains a mystery it will never be found out what force killed the lady at such a critical moment probably it was the strong will of the suti that would not allow her body to be separated from that of her husband even in death another strange incident is reported from a place near agra in the united provinces there were two respectable residents of the town who were close neighbors for the convenience of the readers we shall call them smith and jones smith and jones as has been said already were close neighbors and the best of friends each had his wife and children living with him now mr smith got a fever on a certain very hot day in june the fever would not leave him and on the tenth day it was discovered that it was typhoid fever of the worst type now typhoid fever is in itself very dangerous 
but more so in the case of a person who gets it in June. So poor Smith had no chance of recovery. Of course Jones knew it. Mrs. Smith was a rather uneducated elderly lady, and the children were too young. So the medical treatment as well as the general management of Mr. Smith's affair was left entirely in the hands of Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones did his best. He procured the best medical advice. He got the best medicines prescribed by the doctors and engaged the best nurse available. But his efforts were of no avail. On a certain Thursday afternoon, Smith began to sink fast, and at about eight in the evening he died. Mr. Jones, on his return from his office that day, at about four in the afternoon, had been informed that Mr. Smith's condition was very bad, and he had at once gone over to see what he could do. He had sent for half a dozen doctors, but they, on their arrival, had found that the case was hopeless. Three of the doctors had accordingly gone away, but the other three had stayed behind. When, however, Smith was dead, and these three doctors had satisfied themselves that life was quite extinct, they too went away, with Mr. Jones leaving the dead body in charge of the mourning members of the family of the deceased. Mr. Jones at once set about making arrangements for the funeral early the next morning, and it was well after eleven at night that he returned to a very late dinner at his own house. It was a particularly hot night, and after smoking his last cigar for the day, Mr. Jones went to bed, but not to sleep, after midnight. The death of his old friend and neighbor had made him very sad and thoughtful. The bed had been made on the open roof on top of the house which was a two-storied building, and Mr. Jones lay watching the stars and thinking. At about one in the morning there was a loud knock at the front door. Mr. Jones, who was wide awake, thought it was one of the servants returning home late, and so he did not take any notice of it. After a few moments the knock was repeated at the door which opened on the stairs leading to the roof of the second story on which Mr. Jones was sleeping. The visitor had evidently passed through the front door. This time Mr. Jones knew it was no servant. His first impression was that it was one of the mutual friends who had heard of Smith's death, and was coming to make inquiries. So he shouted out, "'Who is there?' "'It is I, Smith,' was the reply. "'Smith, Smith is dead,' stammered Mr. Jones. "'I want to speak to you, Jones. Open the door, or I shall come in and kill you,' said the voice of Smith from beyond the door." A cold sweat stood on Mr. Jones's forehead. It was Smith speaking, there was no doubt of that. Smith, whom he had seen expire before his very eyes five hours ago. Mr. Jones began to look for a weapon to defend himself. There was nothing available except a rather heavy hammer, which had been brought up an hour earlier that very night to fix a nail in the wall for hanging a lamp. Mr. Jones took this up and waited for the spirit of Smith at the head of the stairs. The spirit passed through this door also. Though the staircase was in total darkness, still Mr. Jones could see Smith coming up step by step. Up and up came Smith, and breathlessly Jones waited with the hammer in his hand. Now only three steps divided them. "'I shall kill you,' hissed Smith." Mr. Jones aimed a blow with the hammer and hit Smith between the eyes. With a groan, Smith fell down. Mr. Jones fainted. A couple of hours later, there was a great commotion in the house of Mr. Smith. The dead body had mysteriously disappeared. The first thing they could think of was to go and inform Mr. Jones. So one of the young sons of Smith came to Mr. Jones's house. The servant admitted him and told him where to find the master. Young Smith knocked at the door leading to the staircase but got no reply. After his watchful nights he is sleeping soundly, thought young Smith. But then Jones must be awakened. The whole household woke up but not Mr. Jones. One of the servants then procured a ladder and got up on the roof. Mr. Jones was not up on his bed nor under it either. The servant thought he would open the door leading to the staircase and admit the people who were standing outside beyond the door at the bottom of the stairs. 
there was a number of persons now at the door including mrs jones her children servants and young smith a servant stumbled upon something it was dark but he knew it was the body of his master he passed on but then he stumbled again there was another human being in the way who is this other probably a thief thought the servant he opened the door and admitted the people who were outside they had lights with them as they came in it was found that the second body on the stairs two or three steps below the landing was the dead body of smith while the body on the landing was the unconscious form of mr jones restoratives were applied and jones came to his senses and then related the story that has been recorded above a doctor was summoned and he found the wound caused by jones's hammer on smith's head there was a deep cut but no blood had come out therefore it appeared that the wound must have been caused at least two or three hours after death the doctors never investigated whether the death could have been caused by the blow given by the hammer they thought there was no need of an investigation either because they had left smith quite dead at eight in the evening how smith's dead body was spirited away and came to jones's house has been a mystery which will probably never be solved thinking over the matter recorded above the writer has come to the conclusion that probably a natural explanation might be given of the affair taking however all the facts of the case as given above to be true and there's no reason to suppose that they are not the only explanation that could be given and in fact that was given by some of the sceptical minds of agra at that time was as follows smith was dead jones was a very old friend of his he was rather seriously affected he must have in an unconscious state of mind like a somnambulist carried the dead body of smith to his own house without being detected in the act then his own fevered imagination endowed smith with the faculty of speech dead though the latter was and in a moment of well call it temporary insanity if you please he inflicted the wound on the forehead of smith's dead body this was the only plausible explanation that could be given of the affair but regard being had to the fact that smith's dead body was lying in an upper story of the house and that there was a number of servants between the death chamber and the main entrance to the house the act of removing the dead body without their knowing it was a difficult task nay utterly impracticable over and above this it was not feasible to carry away even at night the dead body along the road which is a well-frequented thoroughfare without being observed by anybody then there is the third fact that jones was really not such a strong person that he could carry alone smith's body that distance with ease smith's dead body as recovered in jones's house had bare feet whether there was any dust on the feet had not been observed by anybody otherwise some light might have been thrown on this apparently miraculous incident 